Hi, everyone. My name is Megan O'Rourke, and I'm the Associate Director of Regional Programs for the University of San Diego Alumni Association. We are happy to have you here today for the San Diego Torero Club Alumni Business Spotlight featuring our friends at Kensington Brewing Company. 2020 has been an interesting year and certainly has been for the University of San Diego Alumni Association. However, during this time, the Alumni, alumni Association staff is continuing our efforts to keep alumni engaged with and connected to the university. Now that we are virtual, we have pivoted to offering programs that are the, of the greatest need of our alumni. In an effort to support our many alumni-owned businesses, we have created the Alumni Business Spotlight Series, where we chat with our alumni entrepreneurs and learn a bit more about their company and how we, as an alumni association, can help support them in their businesses during this time. In addition to our live audience, we are recording this for later viewing. We will begin the program with a conversation between myself and Zach, and then we will field some questions that were asked during registration afterwards. The event will conclude with a beer making presentation from Zach. Should you have any specific questions throughout the event, please put them in the Q&A feature and we will address them throughout the program. All right, well, let's get started. I'm happy to welcome Zach Knipe, class of 2003, co-owner and founder of Kensington Brewing Company and also former staff member at USD. Welcome, Zach. How's it going, everybody? All righty, well, we're just gonna go ahead and jump right in. So. Zach, our first question for you is, tell me about Kensington Brewing Company. So Kensington Brewing Company was founded about eight years ago. Uh, it's a family owned business um, with myself involved. Uh, my cousin is the master brewer now. My father is our tasting room manager uh, and one of my uh, best friends and fellow alum is a, is a co-owner. Uh, we also have um, some bar staff that support us. Uh, so in the tasting room, we have 24 taps. Um, we run two locations. One's a production facility and one's more of just a hospitality uh, tasting room location. Um, and we have about 50 plus beers that we brew on a routine basis and kind of rotate those through our taps depending upon the seasons and or special requests, things that are kind of popular at the time. Awesome. And uh, the story of KBC. So it's a fun one. You are co-owner with Andy Rogers, who is also a USD alum. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so about 15 years ago, my, uh, my now wife gave me a homebrewing kit for Valentine's Day. Uh, it was one of uh, kind of my first hobbies that wasn't a sport and really, really enjoyed it. Um, it was pretty funny because Andy actually was with me when we brewed our very first homebrew uh, in my apartment. Um, I kind of ran with it. He said, yeah, not so much for me. Um, but then fast forward about uh, seven years later, I had a small commercial size brewery in my garage and was ready to take it to the next level. So I gave Andy a call back and said, hey, this is kind of becoming more of a business now than just a, a homebrew hobby. Are you interested? Um, and so he was, he definitely was, and we, we found a location right in Kensington on Adams Avenue, um, got all the um, branding and stuff done. And then unfortunately we lost the space. Uh, in hindsight, it probably was a good thing because we weren't, I think, quite ready for that retail spot, um, but it did keep us going with the momentum. Um, so we ended up getting a larger warehouse space. Um, and we, we actually partnered with a company called The West Bean, who's now a, a popular coffee roaster in town. So we grew our businesses together. Um, and as we did, ended up moving into a second larger warehouse space, as did The West Bean. Uh, and then fast forward uh, three years after that, opened our second location back in Kensington, where we always wanted to be. So what I'm getting from that story is Andy let you do all the hard work and then wanted to wanted to jump in when he knew there was going to be some profit there, huh? Well, I, I think that uh, this probably worked out the best because he was less interested in the beer making um, and more interested in, you know, the business side and keeping it successful. So he was a good yin to my yang. Yeah, a good partnership, it sounds like. For sure. So how did your USD education help, help build a foundation for your professional endeavors? So formal classes uh, when I attended were in business and in Spanish. Um, and so definitely a good just foundation overall and, and you know, proper business practices. But um, 
really all you know i think everybody knows that you know you have the experience that's formal inside of the classroom and what you learn there but then also a lot of opportunities um, for social interaction internships study abroad and uh, a very long lasting network of Torero friends um, and so i think that my usd just helped me to become well-rounded uh, it reinforced the entrepreneurial drive that i've all, always had um, and then it was a backstop for me when i you know needed those first people to bounce ideas off of my you know fellow toreros were really um, there to do that with and were super helpful wonderful uh, both you and andy have careers outside of your work at kensington brewing company in addition to families for, to care for. So how do you manage it all? Um, just coffee, pretty <laughs> much. Um, but no, it, it, it is tough. Um, I think that early on, um, we just made a decision together that we were gonna be very patient in how we grew the business. Um, we both very much enjoy our careers um, outside of the company and weren't really, willing to sacrifice those to get it going. And so we just, we grew as we could, um, both from time and, and a financial perspective. And so it may have taken a little bit longer than some of the other um, breweries that kind of went out and got venture capital and did a lot of um, just kind of the maybe more normal ways of doing it. But the positive to that is that we've stayed debt free and we've kind of grown incrementally the way that we wanted to. Um, so, and so that was a good approach. Um, and then just investing time in the people that work with us and then empowering them to do their jobs. Um, so I'm there for oversight questions, always there to you know improvise and change the plans when we need to, but I really lean on them to you know be masters of their craft, whether it's pouring beer and interacting with people, you know, selling to stores or actually brewing the beer. I think that's great signs of um, amazing leadership, allowing, hiring the right people and allowing them to do the work, right? You trust the people below you to, to get it done and uh, work all together. For Absolutely. Sure. Yep. So what is the most rewarding part of owning your own business and the most challenging? Most rewarding, uh, in the beginning, it was just being able to produce this product that I've been practicing for so long and then get feedback from people. Um, and so, Actually, it was one of the most rewarding things, but also the biggest challenge, because when we started, we were only um, distributing. And so I would drop off all this product at a store and then I wouldn't really hear much back because the store owner wasn't the, necessarily the one trying it. It was the customers and whatever. And so we got more and more feedback from the restaurant spaces because they were interacting with customers more. Um, and then once we opened our own tasting room, getting that feedback was really cool. And, and hearing that what people you know, were really into um, and getting that pat on the back. And then the peripheral uh, part of having our own tasting room space was just the community connections we were making, um, really being like a gathering space for the Kensington, not only the Kensington community, but you know, Torero Network, lots of different charities and um, other event type things that we host at the bar. So. That was really fun. Um, biggest challenge as it relates back to the whole full-time day job family business thing is just time. Um, it definitely can be frustrating to know exactly what needs to be done, but just not having the time to implement everything and then be, having to be patient with yourself um, as far as how the business progresses. Absolutely. Well, I have to ask this question just because it's so top of mind, especially during this time. Um, what have you had to do to pivot because of COVID? Yeah, so that's a that's been really tough. Um, this is also where I'm really grateful that I have a, a sound-minded business partner and you know a good support network to kind of come up with uh, good ideas because it was challenging. I'm uh, when when we hit mid March. Um, we were planning actually a big uh, party at the brewery for my birthday. And, you know, fast forward two days late, uh, before it was supposed to happen and we're completely shut down. And when I say completely, it means, you know, no, no to go even at that point, um, we were really stuck. And so that began the planning process for how we were gonna react um, and kind of having looked at, you know, there's not a whole lot of precedent for what's going on right now, but just, kind of being conservative and knowing that these things can last a long time. 
um, we made a conscious decision to not renew our lease at our production location down in Mission Gorge. Um, idea being that we could get smaller for a little while and maintain the pig tasting room operations, which is where we want to be in the heart of Kensington, and continue to make uh, beer, albeit on a, a smaller scale, uh, and then be able to kind of um, have a lot more options once um, COVID's over in terms of bringing a new warehouse space in that we would actually prefer. So that was one big pivot. Um, and, and then another was just doing a lot more package product than in tasting room product. Um, the bulk of our sales were in the tasting room and now we're having to do a lot more canning and a lot more distribution to, to move that out to stores. And with that, how can your fellow USD alumni um, help in your efforts, right? What do they need to know about Kensington Brewing? Is it, it's open? Can you eat there? Can you dine in? All these different things, because we know that we want to support our fellow Toreros and the businesses that they have. So tell us a little bit more about where the operations are at right now. Right. Yeah, we've had a couple really good strokes of luck when it, it came to um, managing COVID. And one of those was we were already installing a kitchen in the tasting room um, and partnering with a really, really great um, chef to get that going before COVID hit. And so uh, when the state came out with a mandate that we needed to actually serve food with, uh, with beer in order to stay open, we were ready to go. We got our health department approval in early April. And so when they made that rule, we opened up for operations um, for to go, which was really, really great. Um, and then um, when we that kind of evolved. Now we're able to spill out onto these nice big sidewalks that we have in front of the tasting room, which people have asked me, like, what would you want to stay post COVID? And I, I love the sidewalk cafe thing. I think it's just really fun. And, you know, Little Italy is just a whole different place now. And so is Kensington because you have this outdoor atmosphere. So I'd say um, we're open, come pay us a visit. Um, you can sit outside. We, can, we also have some limited seating inside. Um, and if you're not quite comfortable with, you know, going out to restaurants and things yet, then um, we have great options to go and, and are still looking to grow our presence in other stores. So if there's a favorite liquor store you have by your house and you want to feature Kensington beer, let us know and we'll give them a call. Right on. All right. I think that ends our time for the conversation between you and I, but we have a couple of questions from attendees um, that they submitted during registration that I'd like to run by you. Sure. All righty. Um, the first is similar to what we already chatted about, but what is the biggest business challenge that K KBC faces? Um, right, yeah, right now, obviously, it, it would be COVID. Um, the, the other would be, um, I think that the, the brewing industry itself has, um, obviously, there's quite a few of us. And so depending upon what your plan was for your business in this business space, um, it would be harder to become what I call regional brewery, um, like the Ballast Point, Alesmith size breweries that aren't, you know, maybe they're not national, but they're pretty big presence um, regionally. I think breaking into that market is, um, is more challenging. Um, however, that isn't really what our model has ever been. We really just want to be community focused um, and kind of carve out our niche within the industry. Um, but yeah, if you want to kind of break into that regional size, then that that's hugely challenging just because of competition. And then we talked a little bit um, about COVID, the pivots to COVID. What about social media strategy? And do you utilize social media uh, to promote your business? Heavily? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, and it, it's been uh, a good platform for us, especially um, we tend to have a, a pretty close knit network, right? And so as as we kind of gather more and more interest in our social media pages, we've noticed that I would say we have a, a much higher engagement with our followers than um, we do on say other platforms that I've seen that just, they may have a high, high volume because of the marketability of the site itself. Um, whereas the people that are following us and engaging in our events and things like that are the people that are showing up and throwing their own events or, you know, getting together at the tasting room. So um, as far as any, you know, outside of the box specific um, approaches that we have, I think we're probably pretty typical to most. 
Um, so there's no super secrets there or anything for our social media campaigns. Great. Oh, and then we have a question from an attendee, Mr. Charles Bath. Um, he asked a really simple question, and what is your favorite beer? Uh, my favorite beer is right now probably our uh, Black IPA. So it's kind of a, a mix between a um, large body like Imperial Stout, but it also has the hoppy profile of like a West Coast IPA. So that's my favorite right now. And are there any other beers that you have on top that you'd like to highlight or anything, any other product that you people need to know about? Yeah, probably our featured beers that are our, our most popular are our Kensington IPA and our apricot wheat, which you kind of see in some of the labeling that we uh, showed uh, before we started the presentation. All righty. Well, everyone, if you all have more questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. But now at this point, um, Zach is going to walk us through a beer making presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and start that presentation right now. Um, again, if you have any questions, direct questions about that process for Zach, feel free to put them in the chat. All righty. All right, let's get it rolling here. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, us as a family business. And so right off here to the right, you have uh, four of the principal folks involved in the in the company. And so um, that's actually taken, Kensington has a parade every single year. Um, it's pretty big. They do it around Memorial Day. And, and we usually have about 50 people that walk with us. So the COVID thing this year was a little challenging just because we didn't get to do our parade, but hopefully we'll be on next year. So just touching upon the agenda a little bit, we're gonna go through it. And this is really basic, I know. We can get into a lot of weeds, but um, I figured that the audience here is mostly uh, a 101, and so we're just going to touch on the high-level stuff. So we'll hit what are the main ingredients, um, what's the equipment, what's the process look like, and then what are the influencers on the taste of the product, um, obviously, uh, other than the ingredients themselves. Okay, so the basics of beer. Um, water, uh, malted barley, hops, and yeast. And so uh, there's a lot of strategies with all of these um, and you would be surprised, but one of the most important ingredients that you're gonna put into your uh, beer is the water. It's gonna make up the, the, the volume of it. And so if you have any impurities in it, you're gonna have a lot of challenges in the flavors. And so most of the breweries out there these days are doing remote uh, reverse osmosis filtration and taking the water down to exactly um, kind of just what I would call plain. So we're going to have a lot of the different kind of minerals and things that you would find in you know city water that'll be removed, um, and then you actually build back all of those um, nutrients back into the water to meet the profile of the type of beer that you want to make. And so some beers have these certain flavors to them because they use hard water. Some of them are much more clean. Um, and so that's kind of the role of water as your ingredient. The malted barley, um, there's, you know, tons and tons of different varieties of um, uh, these barley roasts out there that are going to make the body and the um, kind of the color nature of the beer, right? And so you're going to use some of the lighter, lighter colored barleys are going to give you more of your Pils Pilsner style beers, your lagers. Um, and then you get into your really dark roasted chocolate malts and things like that, and that's going to give you your stouts. You have a lot of uh, things in between to you know build different um, IPAs and things like that. Um, but really, the sky is the limit. There's so many different combinations um, that you can come up with uh, when it comes to malted barley. Hops are what's going to impart uh, the bitterness into the beer. Uh, and so um, there was a lot of experiments with beer way, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago as to, you know, what could we put in this that would kind of balance out the sweetness and, and make a, a taste profile that we wanted and hops was uh, what was landed on in history and so that's kind of how it stuck. Um, but it's a cone that grows on a big vine and you dry those out. Uh, most places use um, whole cones for their hops um, and some will use them in pellet form. Uh, and then the final ingredient is 
kind of the magic of beer, which is the different styles of uh, yeast that you can use to initiate the fermentation. Um, so some uh, yeasts are going to give you real spicy flavors. Others are going to be more clean and um, not have, not impart a whole lot of flavors at all. Um, so, but there's there's like I said, hundreds of different varieties of yeast so, uh, as well that uh, in, impact the taste. You can go next. So the equipment. Um, so this isn't really shown necessarily in order, but I'll kind of I'll, I'll talk about what you, what each one of these does. So uh, your mash tun, uh, shown kind of right there in the middle, is where you're going to place all of your ground up malted barley, and you're going to infuse that with hot water, and you're going to make somewhat of a tea, right? And what you're trying to do in that mash tun process is extract all those different sugars out of the malted barley, because that's ultimately going to be the food that's going to feed the yeast uh, when we move it over into fermentation. So generally in, in the mashing process, you're going to uh, let that grain sit for between 60 and 90 minutes. Uh, and then you're going to drain all the liquid off of the grain and move it over um, through the lottering tun, which is essentially where we're adding more water and extracting all that sugar. And then it's going to move into the kettle. So the kettle on the left hand side is where you'll bring all of that hot uh, what you call wort so the water that now has all of the sugars from the grain is referred to as wort prior to fermentation um, you're going to bring that up to a boil that's where you're going to add all of your different hops and hops are added in the kettle at different times to do different things for the flavor so adding more hops in the beginning of a boil it's going to boil for a longer amount of time and it's therefore going to make the beer more bitter. If you add hops towards the end of the boil, um, say 10 minutes before, it's going to add more of a flavor. And if you add it just at the end of the boil, it's going to add more of an aroma. So you add at different points in time to get these different profiles within the beer itself. Uh, so from, it's going to boil in the kettle once again for 60 to 90 minutes, depending upon the beer style. Um, and then from there, the goal is to cool the beer from boiling to, to 70 degrees or below within 30 minutes. By, uh, and if you do that, you're avoiding uh, any potential for uh, bacterial infection um, from other, you know, little critters that are out there that want to get in and eat that um, food that the yeast want to eat. And so you accomplish that by running all of that wort through this heat exchanger that you, you see down to the left. And each one of the little plates in that heat exchanger, every other plate is the hot wort, and then every other plate is a cold medium, whether that's either really, really cold water or really, really cold glycol that's going to cool that beer down and it's going to move it all the way over through this whirlpool to take out any sediment. And it's going to go into the uh, fermenter here on the right hand side. So there you have your 70 degree wort. And that's where we're going to add our yeast that are going to go in there and consume all that sugar and turn it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So most of these big fermenters you see are going to have um, gas release valves on them that will allow the carbon dioxide to escape while letting the beer ferment. Uh, that fermentation process um, takes anywhere between seven to 10 days. Uh, some beers will require a secondary fermentation where you refeed it some more different kinds of sugars and continue. Um, and then others can actually go right into um, the cold storage tanks for um, carbonation and then preparing to package it into either kegs, bottles, or cans. So that's really what um, each of these pieces of equipment does. Um, and I kind of touched on the process a little bit, but we'll, we'll look at that in the next slide. So I won't dwell on um, a lot of the process stuff um, a ton here, but this will this kind of shows you more in a linear fashion uh, what I was describing with what each uh, of the equipment does. So you have your grain storage um, that you're going to go ahead and grind up right into that mashing ton, uh, that where it will sit for like I said that 60 to 90 minutes, uh, go into lottering, 
And then where they're calling it brewing, this is where I was actually saying the boil that occurs within the kettle. Um, so from that uh, boiling process, down in the left-hand corner, you see our cooling. It's going to get us down below 70 degrees to avoid any infections. Uh, fermentation for seven to 10 days. The process here that they're calling conditioning is actually where you're letting the beer settle, cool, and prepare to be put into a package. And then you'll filter out of the conditioning tank and into kegs, bottles, and cans. So influencers on taste. So I touched a little bit on in ingredients and we can talk about those a little bit more. This is a shot of some of our tasters there at, um, on top of the bar in the tasting room. Um, so on the right hand side, you have this darker stout style beer that like I said, is gonna have a lot of really dark roasted malts. Um, uh, we call it chocolate malt and black malt and a lot of other caramel malts that really keep this really, really deep, deep uh, coloration to it. Um, there's also very specific yeasts that go into doing those darker beers, um, porter yeast and stout yeast and things like that. Um, and then as we're kind of moving through um, these different tasters, so these more amber ones are gonna have a lot of your caramel malts in them. And then your lighter beers like the apricot wheat um, and some a saison or maybe a wit beer is gonna have um, lighter um, base grains, um, maybe some wheat, uh, things like that. Um, so, and then the hops are, are giving you your bitterness. There's a lot of really popular styles out there right now for the West Coast IPA, which is really taken over as one of the most popular beers out there. Um, Simcoe, Citra, a lot of those hops that really give you that citrusy flavor in those West Coast IPAs are super duper popular. Um, and then the yeast. The yeast is the probably the biggest influencer on uh, the beer in terms of ingredients. And just because uh, those little guys all kind of impart different little flavors into the beer called esters as they chew up the sugar and turn it into alcohol. But aside from the ingredients themselves, um, that's kind of the straightforward part, right? If you're getting into brewing, you can probably pick up a few books. You can start to read a little bit on what ingredients do, how you can put different ingredients together in order to make certain styles of beer. But then the process itself can actually be um, part of the, what's going to mold the flavor of the beer and ultimately um, determine whether you make a successful beer or not. I think that you've probably, if you ask most home brewers and uh, if they've made a, a bad tasting beer, then the answer is probably going to be yes, because just over um, time mistakes get made and that really has to do with the process. And so um, one that I dealt with a lot was temperature. So you could put the exact ingredients into a beer go through the process that you always do. But if you, if you're the location you're fermenting, say it's in your house is 80 degrees versus 70 degrees, your beer is going to taste extremely different. Um, and that was not necessarily something that was that I was looking at when I first started brewing. And so in the summertime, I might make a beer and say, wow, this is very, very different than the one I made, you know, six months ago when the temperature was different. Um, so even those very small things kind of change how the yeast are going to consume the sugar, um, how actively they're consuming it, uh, things like that, how quickly they consume it. And so it's going to make the beer taste uh, quite a bit different. Um, it, it tends to be that beers that are fermented, what you call hot, so above uh, say 78 degrees are going to typically have a little bit more of a sour flavor to them. Um, than they otherwise would if they were kept um, down around the low 70s or even the high 60s. Um, there's, there's two different styles that are, are common. The most common, common beer you see these days is an ale. And so the temperatures that I'm referencing are for um, specifically brewing ales. It's about 68 to 72 degrees is their ideal fermentation point. Lagers are going to be closer to 45 degrees. And so you actually need a little bit more specialty equipment in order to brew any lager style beer. Time is another one. So some beers um, just require uh, aging through the process. Um, and they're, you know, in order to make a, a real hefty stout with a lot of alcohol in it, it's just going to take a lot of time. Sometimes uh, you do your primary fermentation for seven to 10 days. You need to add in quite a bit more sugar and let that happen again and again and again until you hit the mark that you need for the 
ABV to be what it needs for an imperial stout. So a lot of the wintertime beers you're going to see um, are you invest a lot more time in, in aging them and making sure you get them where they want to be. And then another big one if you're using uh, draft systems off of taps is just the mixture of the gas that you use. And so I'm sure many of you have had beers that are um, carbonated with carbon dioxide and maybe you've heard of nitro beers before. Um, and you can actually blend those gases. Um, and to make what you call beer gas. And, and if it has more carbon dioxide than nitrogen or vice versa, the beer has a different flavor profile to it. So nitrogen tends to be a smaller bubble. It gives the beer a little bit more of like a creamy flavor, um, whereas carbon dioxide is a bigger bubble. So when it hits your tongue, it doesn't quite give you the, the creaminess that you would get with a, nit a nitrogen beer. And then I think on the next slide, I show you some of the different uh, beer profiles here and uh, um, kind of what family they sit in. So this is my uh, little helper here. Um, as we discussed earlier, you know, I'll take all the help I can get, you know, in the brewing process. So, um, but like I said, two major families of beer. Um, you have ales up top, um, which are a little bit warmer fermenting. You can see that those lead into other very specific areas like porters and stouts and pale ales and quiches. And then you have the other family on the bottom uh, of lagers, um, which is more of your, um, you know, dunkel malts and marzins and a lot of, um, of your older style German beers are, are living in that lager category. And so that's it. That's the uh, beer making process in a nutshell. Um, we do. We recently started doing these uh, uh, mixed six packs during COVID, and so you can see some of our labeling um, and some of our different styles in the cans over here to the right. And uh, you can see one of our buddies here on on the left uh, coming in for happy hour with his uh, parents. So appreciate you all joining me for the presentation. I think I'm going to take some questions. Great, thanks so much, Zach. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, so you went through the breakdown of the equipment and all of the different tanks and plumbing and all of that, but what's the, the cost breakdown for all of that? And what goes into that um, cost-wise that you need to have prior to opening your doors? Sure, no, so the, uh, it's a loaded question and that there's um, fortunately in the, uh, Kind of craft beer renaissance we we've seen a big change in the the type of equipment that's out there and so uh, whereas i kind of assembled my first brewery from um like tanks that were used in like wine making and like dairy uh, making processes because they were i could find them a little bit smaller now you actually have systems out there that function more like commercial breweries, uh, they're just much, much smaller scale. And so they're not quite as expensive as a price point. Um, but if, if you're looking at the overall kind of, how I wanna get started, I wanna be able to produce enough volume of beer to have this become a business, um, then you're definitely gonna wanna be in at least the three barrel to up to seven, 10 barrel type beer systems. Um, and then add your location and a lot of different variables. But, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going in to start with any less than say $500,000 um, to kind of go get your basic equipment. And that's, and that's on the small side. Um, it would not be out of the realm of possibility um, to be more into the low seven figures if you wanted to be in a more popular area in the city or maybe have a little bit more production capacity. What is your one piece of advice, or maybe two, uh, that you have for anyone who wants to open up their own brewery? That's a good one. Uh, so if you haven't brewed, obviously I, the first thing I'd recommend is doing quite a bit of that before you, you figured out whether you wanted to make it into a business. Um, the actual operation of uh, making beer is messy. You, half the time you spend just cleaning up equipment and things like that. So if you like doing dishes, I would definitely recommend uh, a career in beer. Um, but, uh, you know, if you if it seems like it's something where it's just you know, the machines doing most of the work and it's a pretty easy process, 
uh, it's definitely hard work. So I'd be prepared for that. Um, the other is um, plan to wear lots of hats, right? Uh, because uh, as most small business owners know, um, you know, you get into it for the joy of making beer and that and doing that whole process. But then along with that comes all of the other things that you need to be good at customer interaction, you know, doing your books, taxes, legalities. Um, and so just be prepared for all of that too. And, and I'm not saying that's not fun. Uh, there came a point in time where I had to make a decision on whether I wanted to be the brewer or be the owner. And so I had to hand the brewing off to someone who is very talented and doing an amazing job. And now I have fun concentrating on, you know, some of the stuff that's more back of house. And then um, in our work as the Alumni Association, we're all about networking. We want to build the Torero community both near and far. And um, one of the things that, uh, one of the questions that someone wrote in, with, wrote in with is the importance of networking, especially in promoting your brewery. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of, um, you know, businesses feel like the social media outlets and the advertising and a lot of the prototypical pathways that you're going to go through in terms of advertising are going to be able to yield the results that you want. And I'm not saying that they don't. There's some magical marketing out there, um, especially in the brewing industry that I think really yields huge benefits for people. But for us, we've always been more of like a, a ground, you know, ground game, grassroots kind of business where, you know, we're networking through people that, um, you know, we support with their efforts, you know, they reciprocate and we just kind of grow like one person at a time. And it's been, um, we've been in the new location for three years now and the number of events and things that we've thrown and the number of new people that we brought into like the Kensington family that then, um, you know, passed us on to others has been incredible. And we do the same thing because we have a very, you know, deep bench of networks. And so if we have a group in there that may be a charity, there's always ideas that come to mind of where we can point them in the right direction to go and get some more support from other you know local businesses and so it really just reciprocates itself and it's a really fun process to be involved in awesome we have one more question and it's how do you gauge the demand of the craft beer industry uh, before you establish the business and then to follow it up do you think the demand is rising um so you know, there's a lot of um, really, really good support entities in the beer industry, like um, San Diego Craft Brewers Guild, um, the CCBA, which is essentially the California Craft Brewers Association. And they're just constantly gathering metrics on how the industry is doing um, in terms of just internally, like, you know, the internal competition type thing, um, and then growing market share with like the beer industry overall. And so we were uh, are kind of in, in stride with a lot of those platforms and they're feeding us really good info that continuously shows that the craft beer niche is growing year over year. We're taking market share away more and more and more from, you know, the, the bigger companies, the national breweries that have been out there for so long. Um, and so that's great news because I, for me, you know, it's always been, um, you know, it might be a competitive market, but when I started, um, I think, we maybe were in the first 60 or so breweries in San Diego, I could reach out to most any of them and they would help me. And we we really wanted to do the same thing. And we've had other smaller breweries that have approached us over time and asked for help and we've been more than happy. And in some instances, they've already you know gotten bigger than we have and it's been awesome to watch. And there's this really cool like community partnership within the industry that, um, that I think is going to help us continue to grow that market share and make it more of an experience-based thing than just getting a six-pack of Budweiser. Absolutely. Um, and we talked about it a little bit, but I would like for you to go back to the family aspect of it, right? So it's you and Andy, and then, you know, there was a little picture of your kiddo helping you out. Uh, talk more about how it's a family business, how you're so rooted in your community, and um, what's special about that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I actually found uh, Kensington when I was a, a student at UST. I had a foreign films class and the only movie store in town was Kensington Video. And so I you know, went over and being from 
more rural Northern California. I was not so sure about how long I'd stay in San Diego. And then I found this cool little neighborhood. And even at, you know, 20 years old, I was like, wow, it'd be really cool to you know live here one day. Um, and so it actually ends up that our business is now in the old Kensington video. And when I wrote my letter to my landlord to say, hey, this is why I want to be, you know, in this location, I live two blocks away. This is where my family is going to live forever and, you know, grow up and where all of our neighbors are going to be. Um, the fact that they had owned that building for 80 years um, really to them, you know, it spoke a lot and they understood where I was coming from as far as wanting to be, you know, a member of my community because they were for so long. And um, so it really just kind of resonates that way. And now, you know, most of our closest friends are, you know, living in the neighborhood and we just try to really build the community that way. And then finally, how can we as an alumni association help you? How can our alumni, you touched a little bit on it, but um, do you only sell to local or can people outside of San Diego um, enjoy your beer or what's the best way to go about supporting you and Andy and your business? Yeah, mostly just, you know, come on in. We'd love to meet you in person. Um, but, you know, that's our favorite way to do it. Um, and then just helping us spread the word, you know, that we're here and we're open and, um, once we get rolling again, um, we just, like I said, we, we thrived off doing events um, and, and supporting, you know, get togethers and, you know, other kind of groups that wanted to, to network and, you know, you know, meet other Turos or, or just other community members that are like minded. So uh, that's really the best thing that you can do. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Zach. We're right up on our time. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I know that that was extremely informative to me, not only to learn a little bit more about your business, which I knew I knew from being friends with you and Andy, but also um, from my role in the Alumni Association, but to also learn more about beer because I love beer and who doesn't? <laughs> I might be your competition one day, so watch out. Hey, I'll, I'll embrace it with open arms. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you so much for everyone who tuned in today and everyone who uh, will be viewing this at a later time. We invite you to join us at many more events coming up. We have almost an event every single day. Um, and so the screen that you see right now shows um, a, a screen share of the events that we have coming up for the next month, right? So we have three steps to world-class performance. Um, don't forget, we have homecoming next week. Um, and it's all week, it's not just weekend. So it starts with Twitter Tuesday on that Tuesday, a State of the University, University Address on Wednesday, um, and then so on and so forth with highlighting Toreros through Torero Talks, Casino Night, a big fundraiser for our parent and family relations team, our virtual Big Blue Bash. We can't do a tailgate, don't worry, we're gonna do it virtually and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and then we also always conclude with mass. So, Please be on the lookout for some of the events that are coming up, especially around homecoming, but we will continue to send you more as uh, we offer many different events that service many different of our alumni's needs. So thank you again, take care, and we hope to see you all again soon.